So, Anna Maria Caballero, um, thank you for joining us today at Pixels and Paint. Um, I'm hoping that first maybe you can introduce yourself to our listeners. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Brady. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, like you said, which you actually um, said quite correctly, actually, my name is um, Anna Maria Caballero. And um, I'm originally from Colombia, but I've been living in the U.S. Um, since really I was a kid um, on and off. So I'm, I'm very much uh, of the U.S. and of, of Colombia. Um, I am a poet, and as a poet, I've always felt that I was an artist. I've published five books, including an NFT book, and have a sixth book coming out next year. Um, I, I entered the Web3 space as soon as I heard about it, really, um, feeling very deeply that this was something that I'd been waiting for my whole life. Um, I always felt that um, poetry deserved to participate in spaces where I personally wasn't seeing it, such as most museums, exhibitions, art fairs. Um, and I, I wanted to help put it there. And I felt that Web3 solved a problem that poetry had, which was transactability. Um, of course, we, we purchase books and we love poetry books, um, but you don't always, you know, honor the craft of the poet and provide sustenance for the poet by purchasing a book of 50 poems for $14. Um, poets usually find, you know, as my, one of my mentors said, uh, jobs to sustain their writing habits. Um, and this is just sort of an accepted part of the craft. Um, but I really wanted poetry to participate and to be transacted in a way that reflected its co contribution to culture um, and the love that people have for it, really. Um, so I thought that digital poems, which you know could participate in this renewed and refreshed interest um, in digital art that Web3 no doubt generated, could um, introduce people to poetry that might not encounter it and also present really interesting opportunities for poets. This comes back to your kind of motto, your rallying cry of poetry equals art. Is, did you sum up the poetry equals art just now, or is there more, more to it? Well, I mean, as soon as I read about it, I wanted to start a gallery, a digital poetry gallery, um, where... You know, I wanted to sell my own work, sure, but I also am, am, have been taking writing workshops my entire life, and I'm always in conversation with poets who, you know, are, are saying, I got a flat tire, and now I have to work extra hours, and all these things that didn't seem to me to add up. You know, when you submit to a journal, Brady, you, you actually pay for them to consider you most times, um, and then you can wait for a year, and then you don't really receive remuneration and beyond the monetary, you don't really know who's reading your work. The, the, the type of engagement, um, at least when you're an emerging writer, is really low. And so I was already sharing my work in social media, via social media, and getting great responses both on Twitter and on Instagram, um, lots of joy there. And I love that, you know, as a writer, you have such a lonely metier that it's so nice to feel like there is a community around you or that you're connected with other writers that you can share your work with. Um, so I not only wanted to share my work via a poetry gallery, but I wanted to share the work of, of my friends and my professors, my, my mentors. And indeed, you know, I, I sort of immediately, as soon as I read about Web3, had the idea to start a poetry gallery. And I pitched it to several people. And finally, I found, you know, the ideal partners to, to launch it with. Um, and it became the verse verse, which the the opening collections feature work from my professors, really, um, from local South Florida poets who who are you know le living legends, truly, um, that contributed poems to to the inaugural collections. Now, as far as poetry equals art as um, as a creative expression. When I first learned of the verse verse and tried to sort of wrap my mind around the proposition of of art and or of poetry as visual art, the one kind of forebear who stood out to me was William Blake. 
I'm wondering if there's anybody else who you can think of predating NFTs that approached poetry as a visual art form or something that should be kind of displayed and or enjoyed kind of atomically versus inside the pages of a book? I mean, I think that there's a lot of text-based art um, available for for us to enjoy. That's, that's, you know, I think there's tons of examples of that from Roche to Cy Twombly to to John Baldessari. You know, there's a lot of text in art. Um, Yeah, Christopher Wool was another one that that stood out, especially when I talked to Pierre Gervois, who is a verse for his poet. Yes, he's an, I love Pierre. Um, David Trigley to me, is, is another one that I, I think of. Um, Cecilia Vicuña is another poet um, who incorporates verse into her work. Um, but there's very few, really. And it's, you know, the, the poetry is sort of embedded into an artwork or, or, or short verse of text. But to find sort of a long, longer poem such as the ones you find in a literary journal from start to finish in an artwork is, is rare. Um, I, I don't immediately have, you know, examples that pop to mind other than the more sort of sloganistic neon signs, you know, type art that you see, you see, you know, in museums and in art fairs. Um, but I feel like that's, that's a different manifestation for me. It's, it's definitely their, you know, sisters, but, but it's not the exact same thing. Yeah, I unfortunately I think that the amount of time that most people spend looking at a single piece of art is far shorter than really than most good art deserves, but also it wouldn't it wouldn't accommodate the looking habits of most people to stand in front of a piece of work and read uh, a long poem. They'll Though I'm I'm doing what I can at Maker's Place to to promote this idea of slow looking, um, which I think would would benefit uh, anybody who wanted to enjoy a piece of of long form poetry paired with visual art. Um, I, I, I mean, poetry requires time and it also requires attention. You can't just like glance at it, like it, and move on. Like to get something from it, you really need to invest. Yeah, and the multiple visits idea, you know, that, you know, the kind of reread, and I think that this applies to visual art as well as, as poetry, that this, this, the, the rereading of a, of a piece, whether it be a poem or, you know, in quotation marks, reread of a piece of visual art versus kind of these days, what happens is you see something once, you scroll, you like, you maybe comment and then, but you never revisit those pieces unless they're in your collection. Um, and I find that revisiting work is often far more rewarding than the first, the first go through. I completely agree. I mean, um, I have a collection that I created with an incredible coder named Hieroglyphica. Um, in which it's called Poems in the Public Domain, and we take poetry from the public domain and we perform readership on it generatively. Um, 15 readers, 14 readers, depending on what what sort of iteration of the collection you see, um, take turns discovering these classic poems. And we, in each reading, in each person, you know, that we represent, we have different pen colors to represent the act of rereading. I love that. Maybe we can talk a little bit about um, poems in the public domain. It was probably my first experience of crypto poetry that stood out to me as as something that I wanted to sit and experience and and re-experience and um, dive into. Can you tell? Uh, can you tell me how that came together and what was the I, you you did just explain the concept, but um, yeah, t- how did it come together and what was the ideation process behind that? Sure. So, you know, um, the the coder and I are friends, we're, you know, neighbors and um, we 
done in a, a collaboration already and it went great. We had a lot of fun um, and we realized that we worked really well together. Um, you know, that's not always the case with everyone. So once there's that click, um, it's nice to continue it. And so he sent me this animation that he developed that was really beautiful of letters floating off the page. Um, and I said, can we use this to perform readership? I'd had this idea for, um, for, for, for poems in the public domain, basically. I wanted, I wanted to, to celebrate marginalia. I wanted to celebrate, for me, you know, the definition of art is really about emotion and about that sense of sort of inspiration and purpose that, that you feel in these bursts. Um, and I feel that when I'm reading something and I'm really connected to it so that I'm writing on the page. Like that, that moment for me is really potent. And I wanted to somehow represent it um, visually and um, generatively, why not, right? Um, and so, you know, he's this incredible coder who does very, very elaborate visuals and he can do all sorts of, you know, tricks. And I think it was really challenging um, for him. And he wrote an essay that we, we co-authored an essay that we, that we published on FX text about it, um, about having to restrain that intention and to keep this as bare as possible because um, the, you know, what you see are just the palm, not just, but you just see the palm. There's no fancy you know, graphics or anything. And then pen marks start appearing where people are saying, oh, I love that line, or, or I didn't get that, or I need to send this to my mom, or, oh, I need to buy eggs, or whatever it is, you know, start appearing in different pen colors, and then the poem disappears. And there's like this small vestige of the marginalia that remains, and then the poem reappears, and a new reader comes in. And so the readers start um, becoming these faint etch etchings, the marginalia, we wanted to create a palimpsest of, of meaning, of layers of reading, um, and each each work lives for hours. If you let it run in your browser, it'll go for hours with new readers. And there, you know, I created so many comments for each reader that there's so many different variations of it. Um, all these doodles that my collaborator also designed that are so great. Um, you know, little trees or hearts or stars or arrows or what have you that we we do um he also did um coffee rings so you see sort of stains on the paper um and we wanted it to not be so precious you know not every comment has to be you know academic and you know deserving of you know brilliance some comments are just really simple like i didn't get it i didn't get this like what is this trying to say um because we wanted to represent all readers and the, the heart of this project is to say that it is reading that writes poetry's survival. If we don't read it, if we don't share it, you know, then, then future generations are not going to read it. If we didn't read Homer, if we didn't read Edna and Vincent Millay and hand it off to somebody else to read it, then these poems aren't going to live. Um, and of course, we also explore authorship. Like eventually, once the poem enters the public domain, it doesn't belong to the to the author technically. It belongs to the reader, um, and so poetry is this living, breathing art that needs us to survive. Um, and I think it's performed really beautifully and very delicately and slowly too. I mean, there was this like tension between how fast we make it run so that people see the action and the new iteration and like they get it, or like are we true to the medium and we kind of make it slow. So it, we found, a, I think, a good pace um, that acknowledges our digital sort of pulse, but, but is also true to, to the act of reading. Yeah, I think that, that piece about not making the, the uh, comments overly academic or like not completely academic is important because you're also, through this piece, you seem to be, in a way, teaching the art of reading you know some of my favorite books to read are actually just commentaries on other texts because i'm so fascinated by the way that that people read things and and the kinds of close interpretations that one person might get that another 
reading equally closely would never get. Mm -hmm. um, I want to pivot real fast and ask a little bit about your collectors. Are these poetry fans, art fans, just Web3 degens? Are they all three wrapped into one? You know, I think I need to really shout out um, my collectors because I, I really have to say that and I think they're visionary because I really do think that we are at a very exciting moment for digital poetry. And I think that the ability to collect poet, poetry from living poets in a way that acknowledges the craft is revolutionary and really exciting. And those who are able to recognize the value in it and like the, the excitement about it, um, I, I think are visionary collectors. Um, I don't think many were poetry lovers. Maybe, I mean, some are, yes, certainly, but not all. Most, most are, are, are people who've really just entered, like, you know, this very particular rabbit hole and found it to be very, um, very rich, very exciting, uh, very full of, of, I think, nuance, right? Um, and depth. How do you see your work inhabiting somebody's life? Um, or is, do you see your work uh, like optimally hanging on a wall, um, in a wallet, um, maybe in some sort of like special app that you access through an iPad or Kindle, uh, where everybody, where literary NFTs can be collected? What's the ideal experience? I guess well, is what I'm asking. For me, I really love, um, I love using voice in my work. Um, I, I love transmitting some of the emotion and intent of my work via my reading. Um, so I think that it's best to experience it in a way that you can have sound. Projections are usually really powerful, I think. Um, they, they give it a materiality that sometimes the screens unless they're really, really high quality, um, aren't able to transmit. But I think, you know, projections with sound are re really great. Um, I also think that, you know, a great way to experience my work is uh, in the books that I've written. Um, and to hold them and read them and write on the pages as well. Well, that, that's a good opportunity to pivot um, toward a few questions that I have about your books. Um, you have a new book coming out, or a couple new books coming out. There's Appetit Mall. Um, that's coming out in June, correct? Well, it already came out in the UK. Here's oh, okay. the cover, and it came out. It's going to come out next week in the US. It'll be available in the US, but I'm launching it um, actually in Powerhouse Books in Brooklyn, and I'm really excited to share that um, Charlotte Kent, who is this amazing writer and art historian um, is going to join me in that in that event. So I'm really grateful that she can she can be there for that. Um, and really excited about it. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? It's a nonfiction book, right? It's a nonfiction book. Um, I wrote it when my, my son came down with seizures completely out of the blue um, when he was six. And it it documents um, that journey in almost it's like live reporting because I was writing it as we were living it. it was like this cathartic sort of outburst of text and I took photographs that are in the book I kept every sort of you know like doctor's order uh, pictures of receipts like all this like weird stuff that we were living um, I was like photographing and just I don't know I think I was trying to condense the experience via language into something I could understand um, and it's, it's written in a segmented, um, format. So, you know, I, it's like bursts of text, bursts of moments, uh, bursts of memory. Right. And, um, it also takes liberty with grammar, liberty with punctuation. It in includes poetry. Um, it takes excerpts from books that I was reading at the time. So it's, it's really just like this, um, so very multifaceted faceted, um, manuscript that documents um, a, a moment in my life. You know, the publisher has had a really hard time sort of saying what it is. He's like, it's a memoir, but it's also, you know, a medical memoir, but it's also like this page turner that you're like reading, 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 because you want to know what happens to your son. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's experimental and it's very much speaking to a creative writing audience. 
um, you know, it, it's, he, yeah, it's, it's its own thing, I think. Um, I'll send you a Not, <laughs> Oh, that would be amazing. I don't want to spoil the ending, but how's your son doing? He's, he's great. Thank God. Yeah, he's great. Thank you for That's asking. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, and then you have another book coming up that you described as a book, a uh, book as sculpture called The Wish. Yeah, so this is actually a book that's, um, I'm publishing myself, but it's a one of one. So I worked with a bespoke book binder to create this volume, which there's only one, um, and it's going to be exhibited at a gallery in Paris, um, where called Avant Gallery, um, in this exhibition, It'll actually take place at, an, at a book gallery called uh, Metamorphose, but the exhibition was produced between the Verse First and um, Avant Gallery. And it contains one single poem called The Wish that was originally published in the South Dakota Review. And it's published 197 times in its pages. One single poem. Um, the digits eventually add up to eight, which is a number of, of abundance. Um, I'll show you the table of contents. But the idea is to create a statement of value, um, a statement of value about poetry. So I'm pricing it as a sculpture, and the collector will own the only edition of this book. You know, books are meant to be reproduced, but this one is not. Um, and so, you know, the poem was originally called The Wish, but it also represents my wish to see poetry transacted in a way that reflects its its value. Um, and of course, there's a digital version of the poem with me reading it um, that a collector will also receive, but mostly I'm, I'm presenting the book as the artwork. I love that. I'm, it brings me to a question that I had in the back of my mind, which is around kind of the, the digital manifestation of crypto poetry as it's as it's been called, and and the book form, and I guess I'm curious what, um, why add voice, why add visuals, um, what do you creatively get, like, what kind of creative satisfaction do you get from putting out a piece with all of these uh, kind of, let's say extra pieces if you're thinking of just strictly literary publishing versus just minting a page or minting a pdf well i think that's a really great question honestly um you know i think that poetry um doesn't devalue itself by participating visually um in in a narrative that exists right now right with with digital art um, so I think that adding, um, or it's not even adding visuals to the poetry, but just envisioning the poem as a different, in a different format that speaks the language of, you know, generations that are living their lives on their phones and on social media and on the internet, um, it in no way diminishes the value of the printed page. I mean, you're just, you're participating you're in conversation with um, an audience and you're speaking their language to share your work. And I think that that will help them be open to it and receive it to your benefit and to theirs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really just sort of acknowledging a reality and, and accepting it and enjoying it and embracing it. And I think that there's great opportunities for collaboration with artists that can prove really um, surprising and um, you know enjoyable and create works of art that, that neither of you might have done on your own. Um, and you know there's also I think opportunities to mint poems you know as a PDF, and that's totally fine. And I think that's a very strong statement in in a way my book makes that statement. Um, because the, the digital file that accompanies it is literally just one page flipping that says the wish. That's it. It's the same page flipping over and over and over endlessly in a loop. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think that poets 
don't really do themselves a service by saying, oh, I'm just going to mint the page and I'm not going to do anything else because my poem is, you know, valuable as it is. Well, sure, it is. Um, but you might have fun experimenting and trying new things as well. Have you seen mainstream publishers in, enter the Web3 space in any meaningful way? Not really. Uh, my experiences have all been with... Um, Web3 native publishers that are want to do stuff. And I'm really happy to work with them. Um, it's been a great, I've, I've, I've enjoyed Web3 publishing. Yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm just interested because, you know, in the last couple of years, the art world has really come around. I mean, I say really come around um, <laughs> to NFTs. They have accepted sometimes begrudgingly it seems uh nfts so i guess i was just curious if there was any corollary yet to mainstream publishing which Actually, i think not. i could um, have expected the time time pieces i'm sure you've oh seen. yes yeah they deserve a lot of credit that's all keith grossman and maya drazen they really deserve like major props for for what they've put out with with time pieces i actually um was happy to be part of the the Deepak Chopra uh, timepieces collection, and it was a great experience. They, they're, they're doing wonderful work. While we're on the topic Boy. of, what's that? Playboy as well. Oh, have they? Yeah, there's Playboy NFTs, and um, actually, Playboy created a collection, or sponsored a collection of of art on the theme of gender and sexuality. I actually, had a poem that was selected for that exhibition. Oh, now that you say that, I do remember reading that, um, I think, on your website Yeah. about that. Cool. Um, speaking of Web3 publishers, maybe you can, can you tell me a little bit about Alexandria Press? Sure. So um, I published a collection of short stories called Trist. Here's the flyer with the covers with um, Alexandria Labs. They're a Web3 publisher, but they've really... They're starting to branch out in a way that I find really exciting. So they've enabled credit card payments on their website, and they're starting to speak about um, producing physical books. Um, so I think they really understand that it doesn't need to be one thing. It can be and should be eventually both. Um, but they did um, they did eventually initially launch as um, only Web3 on Ethereum, um, and they've, they've really done a great job um, of selecting, I think, a diverse range of first books to present from very different artists and writers doing, you know, very different work, like from nonfiction to, to what I did. Um, and I think that, I think they have a really bright future. Um, and they're also enabling a self-publishing branch um, within their system. And I think that will also, I think that's going to do great with writers coming in and wanting to do it on their own. Yeah, absolutely. What do you see the Web3 literary world looking like in, say, three years? I think it's going to be, you know, absolutely like thriving. I, I am very much um, a believer in, in what's happening right now and where this is headed. Um, you know, poetry, like my poetry... Um, has been exhibited at some of the world's top galleries. Um, that's incredibly exciting. Um, I, I just signed a contract, um, for example, with Diario ABC, which is one of Spain's top national newspapers, or number one in Madrid, to produce a series of digital poems for them. They want to release them as NFTs for their readers. And, you know, at the end of the day, I spoke with their team and we've had many calls and they say, you know, sales, sure, we hope that these sell, but really we just want to create awareness. We want readers to learn about this. We want them to see what's possible. Um, they even have a museum and they want to, you know, discuss opportunities there for, for introducing poetry as fine art, digital poetry as, as fine art. Um, and, you know, like them, there's others who are dipping their toe and gaining interest and I really do think it's going to be, it's, it's going to prove um, really exciting for, for writers and poets who, who participate and are active in this ecosystem. Yeah, and I think it's such a 
it's an area that's so ripe for just coming up with good ideas. <laughs> like the the even I mean, you know, um poems in the public domain set off some like a cascade of de- it, in my mind like they're just like oh there's so many this is a great display or um demonstration of what's possible and and there's a million other ways that just that simple interactive element that you introduce could be reimagined for different ends and that's just like one one aspect so I, i'm i'm really excited about what's happening and you're going to be in madrid for the madrid um book fair with this with this project yes so i'm also signing my book in Spanish uh, with my traditional publisher. It's called From Sunday to Sunday, Entre Domingo y Domingo. I'm having a session of you know, signing books there. And then I will be, um, I'll be with the, the newspaper um, in meetings and preparing what we have planned. Cool. I want to um, pivot uh, toward your work in particular. I think we've, we've kind of spoken a, quite a bit broadly about Web3 um and the literary scene therein but um you've described your work as a moment of private rebellion made in public uh can you tell me what the nature of this rebellion is and and what you're rebelling against sure um i i am very much um aware i think of of the pull and push of conversations that we have every day, of the layers hidden between um, our interactions with those especially to whom we are closest. Um, I think family is a very, very rich uh, pool from which to take. Um, And I think that, um, you know, motherhood also opens up many doors and many opportunities to question um, things like, you know, the responsibilities placed on the woman um, and interactions between husband and wife that I think, um, you know, are, are very questionable um, in the sense that, you know, men expect certain things to be taken care of by the woman um, just because it's, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the bearers of life, um, the birthers. Um, at least, you know, that's been my experience um, coming from what is mostly a conservative Colombian background. Um, and, you know, even though I thought at first I was the only one experiencing things, um, the more I share my work, the more people come up to me and say, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, relationship with my parents, relationship with siblings, with my children, thoughts that I have during the day. Um, I, I love, I love a statement and it's actually in my book, The Wish. It's the, it's the epigraph. Um, it's by Mary Howe. Um, and it says, um, to resist metaphor is very difficult because you have to actually endure the thing itself, which hurts us for some reason. Um, so I think that stating things in a very direct way almost breaks them apart. It rips them apart, um, not trying to embellish or, or adorn them with, with fancy, you know, acro- acrobatic wordplay, but just saying, hey, this is it. Um, I think even that's a rebellion from from the writing that we're taught. You know, we're, we're taught as writers, you don't you don't say, you show, or you know, you've got to make it interesting. Um, but this type of writing that that I practice um, really connects with people, and I, I think they see the layers to it. Um, you know, Virginia Woolf said that um, a woman who writes honestly about her life is a feminist. Any woman who writes honestly about her life is a feminist. And I think a hundred years later, this holds true. How does home life inform your creative life? You, I mean, we've sort of touched upon it there uh, in what you just said, but I'm curious, I guess, in more concrete terms. Well, I think it's an evolution. It's an evolving target, right? It's a moving target. Kids grow up. Um, relationships evolve. Um, but I think each stage has been very, very rich. The book that I have coming out is about sort of, it's really about pregnancy and those first months of caring for an infant, all that that involves and implies. 
Um, and now I see myself veering more toward writing about my parents who are aging. Um, you know, I think that, I think I've written about the home life in a way that I feel, I'm not sure how much I have to say right now. I'm sure adolescence will, will prove, <laughs> will have lots of content, will generate lots of content for me. But right now I'm, I'm feeling more toward, you know, my parents. Um, uh, Alicia Ostriker, which is one of, who's one of my favorite poets, she's like a grand dame of the American Academy of Poets, um, you know, writes that she, she writes about family endlessly, 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 and she just repeats that word. And that's how I feel. I feel like I want to write about family endlessly, endlessly, like there's so much there. Um, the way we treat each other, the way we, we don't treat each other, um, and, and it's so universal. You think it's you think it's only you, and then you share it, and people are like, I, first of all, I can't believe you said that. Second of all, thank you for saying it. How do you keep yourself creatively open to those moments and to observing every aspect of your life with an eye toward um, being inspired? Well, I think that I have... I have moments where I'm writing poetry and moments when I'm authoring it. So writing for me is really intense and I don't always want to be in that moment um, because sometimes it can be really overwhelming. But I have months, usually stretches, where I'm just kind of lost and I'm writing. Um, and then I have moments after that when I'm editing, when I'm submitting, when I'm you know maybe formatting them now for the digital space um, and I think that this back and forth um, works really well for me um, that's that's how I feel and, and you know editing is a form of writing too I mean it takes so much work to get a finished poem out in the world or a book um, you've got to submit you know to God knows how many contests or publishers before someone bites um, so so there's there's that whole process I mean actually I have all my proofs here from a petite mall that I just happened to have on my desk because I was making copies to save them. And, you know, this is one of, I think, five drafts that I've saved. Here's another one. Um, I've been just trying to document, like, my whole process. And then I have the one here that I brought up, which was the one that I had handy. Um, it's the galley that I also went through and marked up and then sent to my editor. Um, so that whole process is, is very much writing, even if it's not creating the raw material. What does, can, what is the process, like what is the raw material generating process, part of the process look like? Just kind of writing furiously. Usually on, you, uh, nope, I have, I keep, nope books everywhere where I, you know, I'm just like writing, scribbling. Is there any structure to that, um, to that process or it's just, it's just time to spill out and then you, you go after in the editing phase and, and start to pick things, pick things out of the. Yeah, I edit it. I edit profusely afterwards. And I think that, um, I like to play with form and with rhyme a lot. Um, so the editing process is about giving it a visual form within the page, sometimes to hide the rhyme. Um, so the rhyme is really subtle and it's kind of like just this brainwashing <laughs> in your mind, but it's not like the elegant little, you know, sort of couplets that rhyme. Um, but it's more like jarring, um, in a way. I think that rhyme can be used very, very astutely to, to, to point um, at things that are that are um, disturbing, um, you know, rhyme gives you sort of that sing-songy, playful voice. But if you're writing something that's jarring and there's like a subtle hidden rhyme to it, it can really um, become very immersive. I think for the for the reader. Yeah, are you talking more along the lines of like an internal rhyme or yeah. or a kind of alliteration that? Maybe yeah. seems playful in a a messy rhyme. It doesn't have to be, you know, so so perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I was going to, I have a question here about poem, P O M E, um, which is an especially interesting piece. It's, it's, I think it's as performative as one could get with digital art. Can you describe that piece for listeners and, and tell a little bit about how it came to be? Sure. I'll, I'll try. Um, it's, it's definitely something I think you have to see to fully understand. So I was invited by a curator uh, named Annika Meyer to participate in the tribute to Herbert Frankie, who is this incredible legend in the world of generative art, but he's also a poet. And I think it's fantastic that she invited poets to be part of his tribute. Um, I'm not a coder. I'm, you know, learning and watching YouTube tutorials. Um, so I create a very basic algorithm. But something that I've always been struck by is the elegance of the coding language um, of, of P5JS, which is the one that I use. You know, there's really beautiful words that are used to perform actions like translate, for example, moves your your artwork within the screen in a way that, um, you know, can create some interesting visuals. Instead of saying shift or move or, you know, whatever, it says translate and rotate instead of spin. I mean, there's like this elegance to the language that I appreciate. Um, and I think that um, I wanted to highlight that by creating a very, you know, what I think is a basic algorithm that visually generates a sensation of entrapment. It's like circles of words going around and around and around and around and drawing on the canvas as they go around. They leave a mark um, like words do, right? But every single command that is in P5JS is also incorporated into um, the poem, which is commented out within the screen of the artwork. So the artwork looks like a P5JS work screen. It shows the back office, which is usually hidden, and then the artwork that is generated. Um, and the poem is being read out loud and it kind of goes down line by line. Of course, the algorithm goes much faster than the reading, but it's just a way to highlight how it's being built to generate meaning. And the poem is about emotional entrapment, and the visuals are about emotional entrapment. Um, and I have to say that I love that it was collected by Kevin Abosh, who has a series called Comment Out that was so inspirational um, to my work, his really famous you know, Comment Out series. Um, so it's awesome that it kind of went home to its, in many ways, its, um, I don't know, um, godfather. <laughs> When you are working on a poem, is it, I mean, I guess it's probably different every time, but I'm curious about the point at which you start to ask yourself, and maybe it doesn't a actually happen like this, but the point where you start to ask yourself, how does this, how can I translate this to an NFT that is collectible, that is maybe something new, um, what is... I guess I'm just curious about what's the process bringing it from the page to a, a digitized format? Well, um, different ones. Right now, I'm, I'm very um, into using AI to create uh, visuals that I think are in tension with the, with the words. So, you know, I'm, right now, for example, for the newspaper, I'm creating, a, they asked me to write a poem based on the writings of this historical figure that they own the copyrights to. And this historical figure was obsessed with modernity, um, with like hair dryers in salons and like weird hats that people were wearing and street lights, you know, popping up for the first time. So the poem is called Once Upon a Time Modernity. Um, it's in Spanish, um, but it's it's about sort of like that one moment where newness was magical. You know, now it's like, oh, chat GPT comes out and on to the next. And, um, you know, we have incredible processing and satellites going around and oh, on to the next. Um, but there was this one moment where things were new and it seemed like reality could change in a way that was desired. Um, at least that's how these the writings that I read by this author um, come across, right? That sort of wonder at the world, at technology. Um, so the, the poem uses um, AI to visualize itself 
um, by connecting with AI's image of what Madrid was like in the 1890s, um, which you can with AI do. So I'm trying to find like images that somehow visualize what um, the writer was experiencing um, by going into these artificial records that are somehow based on, on actuality. Um, and it's been a really interesting process. I did it also for a collection that I did for, for a series of poems that I did for Bitforms um, and for a gallery in LA as well. Um, and it's been interesting to see how the outputs vary when I use Spanish versus how they do when, when I use English. Um, so that's something also that's been like an interesting discovery. That's cool. That I'm curious to know how how you use Chat GPT or or large language models in your poetry, if you do at all. I don't really. Um, I I'm such a you know sort of pen to paper, like heart pen paper writer. Um, that it's it's not something that like beckons to me. I think it I think it's it's really interesting, right? But but um, it's like I, I need that moment of writing. Um, Yeah, I um, I see possibilities there because I I am also a writer and uh, I found it useful for work stuff, but not so much for for creative stuff yet. <clears throat> um, I'm curious to know uh, how you would advise uh, a poet or any other kind of literary artist who knows nothing about Web three how you would advise them about just about how they should think about entering web three. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's definitely a steep learning curve in terms of UX UI. Um, so it definitely requires commitment, um, and patience and, you know, getting a wallet and figuring out how to mint something and all that stuff is, is, you know, it becomes second nature, but it's really challenging at the beginning. So I think, I think, you know, I'd encourage patients, I'd encourage them to, to reach out to others. Um, there's plenty of tutorials now online. Um, there's a reporter I love, Meg DeMatteo, that does, she's written great articles on like, you know, how to get started in Literary Web 3. She's done a few articles that I think are, are really wonderful. I always actually send people her, her articles when they ask me. Um, and, you know, I think beyond that, it's, it's just saying it's a land of opportunity. It's a land of connections um, that are, you know, not like the networking connections, but connections where you're actually going to make friends that you, you know, that you meet on social media, on the Internet, and you're going to see them in real life. And, and there's something real being built there. Um, so encouraging people to just, you know, dive in. Cool. Well, um, I guess my, my only my last question, which is normally my ending question, is. Do you have any, if you had a time machine and you could advise yourself, your 20 year old self, uh, on any aspect of creativity or the creative life, what would you say? To trust your voice. What does that look like? Practically it means, speaking. It means writing in the way you're writing, trusting that it is good, that it is true, that it is different, um, and that it'll find you know, it'll, it'll land on its feet. Is there, where can our, um, readers and listeners find, find you? I have a website, which is my name, Anna Maria Caballero, Anna with one N and, um, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram. Um, I'm there. I'm there probably too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, that's where I think a good place to start. Cool. And do you have any final remarks for our listeners? Anything you want to leave them with? Um, just to encourage them to, I mean, if they, they're interested in my work, to really just purchase a book. Um, even though, you know, it, it, I've stated, you know, that it doesn't necessarily reflect the value of, of all the time that was put into it. It's still really meaningful to, to have people buy your books and read them. Um, so, you know, for $15, you can purchase a book and hopefully enjoy it. Cool. Well, Anna Maria Caballero, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been wonderful. Um, I have, I'm especially bullish on 
crypto poetry and think it could go a long way in in reinventing uh, a medium that it seems most of a, a lot of our culture is left behind. So thank you for for all you've done for for poetry and thank you for coming on today. Thank you guys. I can't wait to um to continue the conversation. For sure. Have a great day. Bye bye.